I'd like to express my joy at having a third opportunity to speak with you. The first time we spoke about how one studies Buddhism. The first time. The second time we spoke about how one practices the Dhamma. And the third time today we will speak about the benefits, the fruit of practicing the Dhamma. When we speak about the benefits of practicing the Dhamma, we can break this, we can divide it into two, two categories or two types of benefits. The first type of benefit is happiness, the freedom from problems a life free of problems. The second type of benefit is be able to use that life in the most useful, in the most productive way according to what we, what we need. These two types of benefits can be summarized. We we can, the happiness that results from practicing the Dhamma and the usefulness, the successful living that results. These two together we can call a new life. So in a, one way, in another way we can say that the, re, the benefit of the practice of Dhamma is a new life. We'll begin by speaking about the first kind of benefit, a life, a happy life that is free of problems. You should reflect upon and ponder upon the fact that this life goes along in its process controlled by the, the instincts, that this thing we call life just goes along under the influence and power of the instincts. And these instincts are something that we, we are not controlling. We are unable to control. When the instincts are out of control, they give rise to something called the gilesa, in Thai gile, gilesa or gile. This result of out of control instincts is something we should take a good look at. When, when these gilesa or mental defilements have arisen, we can describe that kind of life as, as sad, as sorrowful, sorrowful or as dukkha. This kind of dukkha is something that we have experienced over and over again. And we have become so familiar with it that most of us don't even think it's a problem. We just think it's normal. And so we'll look at two kinds of living or two kinds of life. Life when these gilesa are in charge, are in control, in possession. Or life when the gilesa are not in charge, when the gilesa are not running things. We'll look at these two kinds of life. If you are unable to see these gilesa, and if you don't understand them, it will be very difficult, if not impossible, for you to receive any benefits from the study and practice of Dhamma. If you're unfamiliar with them, then you won't be able to compare these two kinds of life. You won't be able to see how these two kinds of life are different, how a life of defilement is different from a life free of defilement. So. Even if it annoys you a little bit, come to understand these things 
these gilesa, as they happen in your own lives. Study them and come to understand them as they occur. And as you, the more and more you come to know these things, know the gilesa, as you continually gain insight into them, to that degree you will understand the Dhamma and be able to receive benefits from the Dhamma. So, to the degree, to the level that you understand the Gilesa, to that degree you will be able to understand and use Dhamma. The first kind of Gilesa are something subconscious or below the level of conscious, meaning they don't have an external cause. Nothing external causes them. This kind of gilesa is called nivarana in Pali or niwan in Thai. The usual English translation is hindrances, but the Pali word nivarana, nivarana, is a useful word to remember. The word nivarana means to hinder or to obstruct, to separate, to keep away, meaning that these kinds of gilesa, this, this kind of gilesa, keeps the mind away from a state of coolness, calm, calmness, and peacefulness. They obstruct the mind becoming peaceful, calm, and cool. Whenever the mind is not in a, a cool, calm state that we might call blissful or whatever you prefer, when the mind is not in a state of bliss, then if you look closely, you will see that the mind is being bothered and pestered by the nivarana. The nivarana are discussed in many books and in often in great detail. Today we won't have time to go into that kind of detail. So you are recommended to study these things from some good books on the subject because it's an important thing to understand. Today we'll just talk about the essential points. The Nivarana can be broken into a few different types. The first type comes from a deep inner tendency from a, a tendency within that is a tendency towards greed or lust. This tendency is dominated by, by sexual desire and by sexual feelings, sexual type of things. <laughs> I can't think of the right word. And so if if you examine the mind, when it is in a state of lust or greed, when lust and greed are preventing the mind from being in a clear, happy, calm, blissful state, if you look closely, you will see that these, these kind of nivarana hindrances are rooted in sexual feeling, in sexual appetite. The next important point about the nivarana is that they are not caused by external things. They do not have external causes. For example, feelings of lust and greed on the level of nivarana <coughs> do not need someone or something of the opposite sex to come by and trigger those kind, that 
the nivarana. We can be alone in the woods, off by ourselves, and still these feelings, these tendencies, these hindrances of lust and greed will still arise. If these arise when they are when they are triggered by an external cause of some sort, we call this the gilesa. They are full blown, complete, full strength mental defilements. But these nivarana that we're talking about are not as strong as those. They are a lower, more subtle level of mental defilement, which we we call the nivarana, the hindrances. We can say that they are half strength or incomplete gilesa, if we wish. And these incomplete or not not full strength gilesa do not need an external cause. They can re- arise from within. Just because these nivarana are not full strength gilesa, just because they are not complete mental defilements, doesn't mean that they're not something worthy or worth your taking a look at. Take a good look at these and see how much that they annoy us, how much they bother and pester us throughout every day, throughout our lives. Take a good look at these things. For instance, the sensual desire we've already been talking about. See how it interferes with a cool, calm, peaceful, happy life. For example, when you're trying to write a letter, a task as simple as writing a letter, and you can't do it because your mind is full of desire towards all kinds of other things, or even desire with not a direct object. It's not necessarily a strong, powerful desire. Just a small little desire bothering the mind constantly. It's not, it's not like a tiger that's going to just kill the mind. It's just mosquitoes and fleas buzzing around and pestering it all the time. So take a look at these nivarana and see that just because they're not very powerful, they're still cause a, they still cause a lot of trouble and are, are worth our attention. The second type of nivarana is in Pali, payabata, payabata, which is being unsatisfied with, being not contented with things, or being a a feeling of ill will towards things. We can have this lack of content with everything. Sometimes we will think of things just so we can be unsatisfied with them for no other reason. We'll just dredge these things up to feed our discontent. And also we will often be unable to be content with ourselves. So this, this lack of contentment or this ill will, payabata, something which is obstructing and bothering the mind, it, it leads to uneasiness and confusion. So take a good look at this and see how much it's bothering you in your daily life, in whatever activity you're doing, whether you're sitting, walking, listening, working, eating. Come to see how this bothers you in your daily life. If, if the, if the caught, there is a direct cause of this non-contentedness, this ill will, then 
we would call that kind of ill will, which has a direct cause, which is directly aimed at something. We call this gilesa, mental defilement. But if it's just arising within, from within, without an external cause, then we call it nivarana. This nivarana, the nivarana that arises from within, it comes from tendencies which have been deposited through our familiarity with the gilesa. As the gilesa happen over and over again, in this case, as we feel ill will or non-contentment, discontent towards others, ourselves, and specific things, as this goes on and on, each time deposits a little something and these deposits build up. And this, this build up is called the tendencies, the anutsaya, anusaya. And from these anusaya come the nivarana. And this is why the nivarana will happen, will, will come into their function of disturbing the mind, even when there is not a direct external cause for them. Because of this, it's, they can be very difficult to deal with. The gilesa will generally have a specific external cause which we can pinpoint. But these nivarana are not so clear-cut in where they're coming from. And so... This is why we need to look at them, because they may not, they're more subtle, and they're arising from within. Nonetheless, they bother and pester and disturb the mind constantly. So we need to observe them while they're happening and while they're coming into existence, so that we can begin to deal with them. Generally, there are, we talk of five nivarana. The first kind we already mentioned is sensual desire. The second one is ill will or discontent. The third, fourth, and fifth can be are all based in ignorance, in delusion. The third nivarana, the third kind of nivarana is Tinamita. Tinamita is a lack of energy. It's when the mind lacks energy, when it lacks the the energy to, to work, to function normally. It's a lack of clearness and brightness. It's a lack of activeness. When the mind is kind of dull, not sharp. This includes when we're feeling sleepy. When we're sleepy and the mind becomes dull. Or when we've eaten too much and the mind is dull because we weren't paying attention to what we were eating. Then it's difficult to listen or whatever we're doing. So this is Tinamita, the third of the Nivarana. The fourth nivarana is the opposite of the third. It's an agitated mind. When things are always popping up and bubbling up and frothing up in the mind. And we could consider this a kind of nervous disorder. But you can, if you watch it, you'll see this. I think many people have seen it in their attempts to meditate. This disturbance, this un-out-of-control activity in the mind, which we can call agitation. An example of this fourth kind of nivarana is when we're unable to sleep at night because the mind won't slow down, it won't stop. 
just thinking and thinking and thinking of all kinds of things, unnecessary mental agitation. So when the mind is in a state like this, when it's running all over the place, when it's getting involved with all kinds of things, when it won't slow down, it won't rest, this is agitation. This kind of agitation interferes with whatever activity we're trying, that we're involved in, such as <clears throat> trying to write a letter. When our mind is like this, we can't, we can't stay focused enough on our thoughts and the paper and the pen to write even a small letter. The fifth nivarana, chitta. This fifth one is wavering or unsteadiness of the mind. It's uncertainty about what we're doing. Specifically, not being certain that what we're doing is correct and safe. We don't even have this basic level of confidence or of, of certainty in what we're doing at the moment. And when we lack this certainty, it's, it's wavering, it's, it's doubt about what's happening. This is the, the fifth of the Nivarana. If you're a believer in a religion that depends on strong faith, such as faith in God or faith in something else, then you will probably not have much of a problem with this Nivarana. But if you're following a religion that is based in self-confidence, then it's much easier for this doubt, skepticism, and uncertainty to arise. This uncertainty or non-belief or doubt about what it, what we have, what is now, or what we're doing now, can be towards all sorts of things, such as our health, or our economic situation, or even our personal safety. This, this doubt about these everyday matters, um, this doubt, this doubt can bo be both on the level of everyday concerns, or it can also be towards the Dhamma, towards that you have been hearing about. Because of this doubt, we are unable to depend on things, we are unable to use things properly because of this uncertainty. So uncertainty about everyday things prevents us from making use of them properly. And when we have doubt about the Dhamma, when we think, oh, it's probably just a load of garbage, it doesn't, oh, it doesn't make much sense. If we have doubt like this, then we will be unable to make any use of, of it, of everyday things and of the Dhamma. For Christians, doubt may arise towards God, or the Bible, or about Jesus Christ. For Buddhists, the doubt may be concerning the Buddha, may be uncertainty about the Buddhist scriptures, or the Dhamma, or of the practice. So when, when someone has even the slightest bit of uncertainty that everything is correct and safe. That person has, is under the influence of this nivarana. So long as there's just a little bit of uncertainty that everything is correct and safe. And may be possible for you to observe and see that this Wichikita is in the subconscious all the time. 
So these five things together are called the nivarana, not nivarana, like I sometimes say it. <laughs> the second is an, a short a, not a long a. So nivarana. These five things come to see what the mind is like when it is not bothered by these five things, by these five nivarana. Come to study the mind when it is free of these hindrances, of these obstacles. And when you've had a look at this mind that is free of the nivarana, then think about it. Can we call a life like this new life? Would it be appropriate to say that when the mind is free of the nivarana, that that is a new life? It's worth thinking about. So now we have to talk about the gilesa, the, comp the full, fully developed mental defilements. When they're only half formed, half developed, we call them nivarana. But when they're fully developed, we call them the gilesa. So now we need to look at them to be able to understand this whole discussion of mental defilement. We may not be able to see the, the subtleties, the finer side of these gilesa. But it is very easy to see their symptoms, to see the influence that the gilesa have on the mind and the symptoms that they give off that we can experience very, very easily and which we can know and un we can know very clearly. For example, we may not understand what Elect electricity itself is, but we can see all the things it does in various appliances and electrical equipment. Even though we don't know the electricity itself or understand it or see it, we can see its symptoms. There are many, many kinds and types of these symptoms, but it isn't necessary for us to talk about all of them. We will talk about the most important ones which cause the most trouble in our lives. The first one that we will speak of is love. When the mind is in this state of love, see what it's like. Is it enduring any hardship? Is it going through any suffering? Is it carrying any sort of burden? What, what um, are the effects of this love on it? This is something that each of us should be able to, to understand as all of us have probably had some experience with this thing called love. Last time we mentioned that the, gile the meaning of gilesa is something that pierces or stabs. So each of you can, should be able to know for yourself whether this thing called love stabs, whether it pierces. This you can look and see for yourself. Other meanings of gilesa are something that burns us. Another meaning is something that binds us or chains us. And another meaning is something that encloses or imprisons us. So you can take a look at this and see if it leads to if it's a problem or not. There are many people who say that love is bliss. But from the Dhamma point of view, we see that love causes problems. <laughs> it um it's a heavy burden and it's, it agitates the mind. It's a very big enemy of peace and calmness. And so, you can all take a look 
and see whether this thing called love is bliss or whether it's got a few drawbacks. This thing that in, in everyday speech is called love is conditioned by ignorance. Even if sometimes, in some situations, there is a love that is conditioned by wisdom, generally it's conditioned by ignorance. And so, even this kind of love that is conditioned by wisdom, once it arises and we start calling it love, then it becomes ignorant again. Take a look at this thing called love and see if it's a problem or not. It's a burden that comes from the instinct to preserve the species, the repro to reproduce. Take a look and see what problems it causes. Are there things that it forces us to endure? Is it a burden? And see how much of an obstacle this is to peace, to calmness, to tranquility. Even the kind of love which is non-sexual, such as love for our children or love for our parents, even this kind of love causes problems. It gets in the way of peacefulness, of, of tranquility. What is worth considering is if we do everything as if we loved, as if we were doing it with love, but we're not doing it with love. Is this possible? Can it be done? To act as if we were acting with love, but to not have this defilement of love interfering with peace and tranquility. In Dhamma, we talk about kinds of love also, such as metta, loving kindness or friendliness, and garuna, compassion. But these two, metta and garuna, must be correct. They're not correct, they're just a mental, they're just a gilesa, a defilement. If metta and garuna are done with distinctions, or if there is, they, then they lead, to, they lead to problems. Or if we're unable to love what we want to love, is that a problem? So, the things that we may speak of in Dhamma as, as love or related to love, these need to be done correctly or otherwise they're just a mental defilement either directly or indirectly. So in summary, love is a problem because it prevents peacefulness. So it needs to be controlled. Or, if possible, it needs to be abandoned and given up in order that there can be true calmness and true peacefulness. And so we must change this from the love, the, from defiled love to Dhamma love. From defiled love to Dhamma love. So a kind of life that is free of the, the influence of love, free of the agitation in non-peacefulness which love causes. Can we call this a new life? Is that, can we call it a new life? The second gilesa or kind of gilesa is anger or hate or disliking, not liking. This is another kind of fire which burns. It imprisons us. It disturbs us. This anger is something that each of us 
can know, which each of us knows. We know how unpeaceful it is, how disturbing it is. I'm sorry, with the last one, I said anger and tacked on a few other words. But let's separate them and have a third one. So there's anger is the second one. The third one we can call hate or not liking, Hmm. which is somewhat different than anger. So when something dirty comes by, or we see something ugly, something disgusting, hate arises. And, and we're unable to control this hate. It just it happens. And this is another kind of burning, another kind of possession of being out of control, which is very disturbing and very destructive. So think what it would be like when there's nothing to love nothing to hate. When there is nothing that we hate or do not hate. For example, for the Arahants, the Arahants, for the fully enlightened people, who, for them, there was nothing that they loved and didn't love. There weren't things that they hated. There weren't things they didn't hate. Think about the kind of peacefulness that that would be, that that is. Don't misunderstand and think just because we don't hate something that it's going to be dangerous for us. But in fact, it's the hating that is dangerous and not hating is safe. For example, in this world, there is one rather disgusting example of hate. White people hate black people. Black people hate white people. What's what's the reason for this? There's there's no reason for this for hate like this to exist. And if we understand properly, then we won't hate. There will be no hate. Fourth. Yilesa is fear. This is fear based on desire, it's based in selfishness, it's based in ignorance and non-understanding. Fear is something that everyone in the world knows. And because nowadays everyone in the world is afraid, especially we're all afraid of nuclear war, nuclear devastation. When we're afraid, we become helpless. When, we're, when there is fear, then we don't have the ability to, to struggle or to cope or to deal with the situation. So to be unafraid is much better. Fear comes from the, the instinct of egoism. And if there is not enough knowledge and wisdom, it is impossible to control this instinct. But through the study and practice of Dhamma, the necessary and sufficient wisdom can be developed so that this instinct can be controlled and then fear will not arise. Understanding of and wisdom about anatta, non-self, is, will help us to be free of fear. It will help us to take ourselves out of its control, out of its influence. You, all of you can probably see that this fear has no use whatsoever, that all it does is lead to dukkha. And so, if we are able to be unafraid, even in the face of fearful and frightening things, then we will be in a much better position to deal with them and to to do the business of living.
even when we must struggle with an enemy, if we can do it without fear, we are in a position to to struggle most efficiently and most skillfully. But if there is fear, our abilities are weakened, our wisdom is diminished, our mindfulness will be weak, and most likely we will be defeated by whatever enemy it is. But if we are unafraid, we can use our wisdom and mindfulness and skill in order to defeat this enemy. There are other kinds of gilesa, such as worry. This, this next one is, is a kind of worry. It's, it's like nostalgia or like always thinking about things we love. It's a kind of worry associated with things we love and that we're, we can't get these things out of our mind and we're always just going round and round, bothering ourselves, worrying about them, wondering about them. And this gives us headaches and it keeps us from sleeping at night. This is another kind of gilesa. The next one is envy or jealousy. This is a result of, in, this is instinctual. In children it happens without them having to be taught. And this envy or jealousy, it's a big problem for the person who feels the envy or jealousy, but it's no problem at all for the object of the envy and jealousy. The next one is stinginess or miserliness. It's a kind of selfishness, for, ex for example, between husband and wife when one or the other <laughs> won't, won't mm -hmm. share anything with the other, like a husband won't give anything to his wife. So these six things are examples of the gilesa. There are many, many kinds of gilesa, many, many possible examples to talk about, but we don't have the time. So we've used these six examples to illustrate how these, when these six things are, when these are present, that there is no happiness. This is, which also illustrates that when they, there are none of these defilements, then there will be happiness. So, when the mind is free of these symptoms of the gilesa, these symptoms that we have discussed as illustrations, when the mind is free of these symptoms, then there is peace, coolness, so this is the first of the benefits of the practice of Dhamma. And now in the time that remains, we'll talk about the second benefit. This first benefit is one kind of the new life that results. Now we'll talk about the second kind of new life that is that arises with being able to use the life, being able to use life skillfully in the most skillful way in the most useful way, <laughs> according to our, our needs. First is, we can be, there is enough control that happiness will arise whenever, whenever there is a need for it to arise. For example, when we have practiced mindfulness of breathing completely, when we have mastered the whole process, we will be able then it is possible for genuine happiness to manifest whenever and wherever. When there's a need for it, there it is. This is because that after practicing anapanasati fully, we have power, we have control over the mind. which means we can have instant happiness as we need it. Second is that we can make use of the sense organs to such a highly de developed level that we could even call this them divine, 
divine eye, divine ear. By this we mean that they have more ability, more effectiveness than is ordinary. So it, eyes that are more efficient than ordinary ears that hear better than ordinary and so on with the other sense organs. The third is the ability to control the mind that, so that it is always in a state of correctness. This kind of control that we're talking about comes in three kinds. Control of the feelings, the vetana, control of perceptions, sanya, and control of thought, vitaka. So by controlling these things, the feelings can be controlled so that they don't lead to dukkha. Perceptions can be controlled. They can be stopped when necessary, or they can be controlled so that they don't give rise to dukkha, so that there is no misperception or wrong perception. And the same with thinking. Thinking can be stopped, or thinking can be controlled so that it is correct, and so that thinking, the perception, feelings, no longer lead to dukkha, but when necessary can be used as we need to use them without giving rise to dukkha. For example, with feelings, delicious food, if we're unable to control the feelings that arise with delicious food, then we get diluted by the deliciousness and eat more than we should, and this causes problems. But if there is control of the feelings, then this doesn't happen. The feelings are no longer our boss or our master. They don't control us and we are free. We don't change the deliciousness into disgustingness. If it's delicious, it stays delicious. But what, instead of being controlled by the deliciousness, we are no longer controlled. It's recognized as delicious. It's experienced and known as delicious. But instead of getting lost in the deliciousness, there is self-control. We just say, ta-ta-ta, suchness. That's all it is. It's just delicious, nothing more. And then there is freedom. It's very, very easy to see in the world today that people are really going crazy about deliciousness, spending lots of time making things that excite the desire, things, making things that are delicious just for the sake of their deliciousness. And then we're competing for these things and we're getting in fights over these things and we're having wars because of these things all because we have lost, we are not in control of deliciousness. We are its slave. The word Satan, the devil, or in Buddhist, Mara, the tempter, is, comes from stupidity and ignorance about deliciousness. This is what Satan is. So first we talked about controlling the feelings now we'll talk about controlling perceptions, this thing called perception. If in the past we had a poor memory, with this kind of control, we'll have a good memory. And we won't go around misperceiving things. We won't be making distinctions or labeling that causes problems. For example, we'll be free of the distinguishing, the perceiving of things as male and female. When we no longer distinguish, when we no longer perceive things as male and female, then we will be free of the problem and the, the problems that arise out of maleness and femaleness. The last one of these is controlling the gilesa, 
which is the same as controlling dukkha, controlling the attachments. If if the if upatana upadana can be controlled, upadana is the Pali word for attachment. This can can be controlled, then the concept of I will not arise. Without this concept of I, there will be no gilesas. So by controlling upadana, then we, the gilesa are controlled. When the gilesa are controlled, then dukkha does not arise. So the third of these kinds of control is the control of upadana, of attachment, which controls dukkha. So when we talk about being able to use life, we've got these different ways. First is the ability to be happy whenever it's needed. There's the, be, the sense organs, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind, can be much more effective, much more, it has much stronger ability. The third is control of the feelings, perceptions and thought so that they don't give rise to dukkha. And the last is free, controlling the controlling upadana, attachment, so that dukkha does not arise. With these kinds of control, with these abilities, then we can use things, we can use life in a much more skillful way, in a way that can accomplish whatever we need to accomplish. If you look at this, you'll see that this is the highest kind of new life. This is the new life in its complete meaning. It's the supreme kind of new life. This is what you will receive from using Dhamma in the right way, from using Dhamma successfully. First thing, the first topic was the study of Dhamma. The second one was the practice of Dhamma. And today, the results that arise from the practice of Dhamma. So take a look at these. Take a look at these results, these benefits that will happen with the practice of Dhamma and see whether or not they're worth, they're worth the practice. And so finally, I'd like to express like to show my joy and happiness at the activity, the action and the that each of you have undertaken in beginning to study and practice and receive the benefit of Dhamma. And finally, thank you. Thank you each and every one of you for coming to this place. Thank you for making use of it. Thankful, thank you for helping to make Suan Mok a useful and beneficial place. You don't have to thank us, just allow us to thank you. And we would like to close the meeting on that note. Thank you.